Have you heard of FIRE yet? It's a movement to achieve financial independence so you can retire early. But does FIRE mean you need to make six figures or live in an RV? Bob Lai from the site Talkin' comes on the show to discuss what FIRE really means and how it applies to Canadians. Welcome to the Maple Money Show, the podcast that helps Canadians improve their personal finances to create lasting financial freedom. Are you ever unsure about how much room you have left for RSP contributions? Our sponsor, Well Simple, has an RSP tracker that takes into account your salary, just for any raise you get, plus the contributions already made to your RSP and employer plans. Find out more at maplemoney.com slash wellsimple. Now let's gather around the fire with Bob. Hi, Bob. Welcome to the Maple Money Show. Thanks for having me, Tom. Thanks for being on. Um, so uh, I want to talk about fire. It's, it's, it's a big uh, movement lately. And, and I feel like I, 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 it, it kind of came up but as a surprise to me. I didn't realize it was a thing until maybe two or three years ago. Um, can, can you kind of just take us back right to the basics and explain what does fire stand for, but also what is it? Sure. So fire stands for financial independence, retire early. Um, I don't actually know who put up with that, put together that acronym, but uh, essentially it's just that you, you save enough and you uh, invest enough in uh, appreciating, appreciating assets where it generates enough passive income to be equal or exceed or greater than your, uh, or your annual expenses. So at that point, you're financial dependent. Um, and once you're financially independent, you could choose to retire early if you want to, or you could continue to work. You have the, the freedom. Um, the movement is getting more and more popular as a lady. It, it's getting a lot of media coverage, but I think it's a little bit mislabeled somehow because a lot of the, actually most the media coverage like CNBC, you know, Yahoo, uh, MSN, and all these big names, even like uh, uh, New York Times and stuff, they all focus on the retire early part. And it's it kind of mislabels the movement a little bit, I think, because a lot of people are financially dependent. And in fact, they're still working, but in a different aspect, right? So um, for example, um, Mr. Money Mustache, he's like a very well-known figure within the fire community or personal finance community in general. Um, he was financially independent and then he retired from his uh, work. I think he was working as a computer engineer and now he works as a carpenter, like as a hobby, right? He still makes money, um, but he likes it. So like some people think, some people think that he's still working in the traditional sense, but from his point of view, he's not working. He's doing stuff that he enjoys, whether he gets paid or not, it doesn't really matter. Right? So, it's unfortunate these a lot of these media sort of put a little bit of spin on these stories to make people want to read them. So it, it kind of puts a negative vibe on the fire movement. But in general, I think the, the fire movement is pretty positive. It it basically just stands for you know finding the freedom so you could do things you want in life. That's that's how I understand it. So there's nothing wrong with continuing to have some sort of job even even someone if they're 80 years old and retired they might work at walmart just because they want to talk to people not because they have to even necessarily exactly like they like take ourselves for example like my wife and i we technically could be financial independent but we decided not to we're prolonging our fi journey and you know if we we're, we're aiming to be fi by early 40s um but we're not really in a hurry to get there by now and whether retire or not, um, like retire early or not, it's, it's not really, um, we'll just kind of play as it goes. Like if it happens, it happens. If not, you know, we'll see what happens, right? Like we, I might continue working on my, at my full-time job. I might, things might change because it's high techs. So who knows? Who knows? Ask me again in five years, right? So, Yeah. And I guess it's still about having that, that, independent choice right like if, if you feel like you're able to retire it doesn't mean you have to retire you, you can continue to to not only get that paycheck why not but but it also gives you a chance to 
to spend time with peers, right? I assume you yeah. probably like your job. And, <laughs> so, yeah, so and, and the, the big thing that people need to understand is when you have the power to decide whether you want to work or not, you're no longer tied to that, in, that paycheck every two weeks. So you could quit like today if you wanted to, right? Whereas before, when you're not financially independent, you're like, well, I would like to quit, but I kind of still need that paycheck, right? So it's, it just shifts that mentality, that power completely. You're not like, say your, your job is laying 50% of the people tomorrow. You wouldn't be worried about it, right? Because you know, I'll be fine either way. So that, that's kind of the, the power. The power now belong, belongs to you rather than your employer, for example. Yeah, with, with my day job, I've gone through a reorg of the, of the company or the department almost once a year uh, for, for quite a while now. And, and, and I, I totally get that, that mental aspect where, where I've got something going on the side with my business and, and it, it, it sort of changes that mindset where you're, it's, you're not in total fear. It's like, I, I, I can make this work if I had to, but, but for now I'm, I'm staying with my job. So exactly. I, I, yeah, I totally get that, that mental aspect. And I think that would apply to anybody, even if they, we're driving Uber on the side, like j- just making some extra money would take some of that pressure off of this idea where like everything's riding on this one job. Yeah. It's about, how, it's about uh, having multiple income streams too. Right. I mean, the idea of you, you buying, you know, stocks or, you know, uh, real estate, or, you know, if you have royalty somewhere or side business, businesses that generate income. So you're not just relying on one single source that's another way to look at it, right? Like right now, if you, you're working full-time job, say 99% of your income comes from that job. If you get laid off, that's it. You have to find another job. But you, if you're able to have different side businesses going on and passive incomes as well, it's not as much of a burden if you don't have your full-time job anymore, right? So that, that's part of the equation as well. Yeah. Now, you touched earlier too on this idea that that in the media they they kind of focus on whether or not you're truly retired and and I've even kind of seen that in the community people can have different opinions on on whether that that counts or not but I've also seen the other side where um pe- people in this this fire community kind of get upset if someone's not frugal enough or something like that uh, yeah. can you explain what's going on there a bit well it's it's almost the opposite of keeping up with the joneses which is um <laughs> could be very detrimental. Um, so like, you know, in, in the fire community, I suppose people, a lot of people compare, you know, savings rate, right? So by savings rate means you're the, uh, what is it? Let me think about it now. So the amount of money you save each month divided amount by the amount of money you earn each month. So that gives you your savings rate per month. So, you know, your traditional, personal finance experts say you need to save 10 to 15% for retirement. And within the fire community, people are saving, you know, 50, 60, 70%, even 80% of your, of their income each month. And, and that puts a tremendous, tremendous amount of pressure. If you're actually comparing yourself to, to another fire person. But I think that's, I mean, it's encouraging to see what other people are doing, but you shouldn't be, feel trapped or feel pressure to have to keep up with these people because everybody's situation is different, right? Like some people are dual income, some people are single income, some people have kids, some people don't have kids, you know, like we live in Vancouver, one of the most expensive cities, you know, somebody could be living in, I don't know, um, Raleigh, North Carolina, which has a, certainly a lot lower cost of living compared to Vancouver. So it, it's, it's, it's so hard to compare. So it's, um, it's tough, but I think the important part is people could encourage each other, like help each other and like connect, um, like, you know, what can we do differently and stuff that I think that that's very helpful within the community instead of having to compare all the time. Right. Cause the other side of the thing is compare your net worth. And again, it's, it, you can't compare just because we're both say we're both 35. It doesn't mean we should have the exact same amount of net worth because we come from a different background. We might have different jobs. We, our, our living situation is completely different. So it's, it's not very fair to compare savings rate as well as net worth. Mm-hmm. Is this something that is sort of, 
obviously it's better if you have a higher income, but, but is it sort of only for people with high income? I've seen stories where it's like, Oh, someone was saving 75%, but Oh, they make $200,000 and their spouse makes 150,000. So it's like, well, okay. <laughs> you can save yeah, 75%. That, so. that, that's another, uh, another negatives from within the fire community in general. I think that's people are saying, Oh, it's, it's usually, you know, white, male in in the tech sector which means they make a lot of money or somebody in the tech sec- sector which you know you're making six grand six figure money um and you know it's quite often people are like oh and the spouse is working as well or you know so they're double income and maybe you know, no kids they're make, they're maybe no kids so they're making like 250 grand a year i mean it, it shouldn't be it shouldn't take a rocket scientist to to save a million dollar if you're making 250k a year right like that that i get so that's true but at the same time i think it's also possible to to reach fire when you have a lower income as well it it does take more time does take more sacrifices but it's also possible now the 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 basically the the fundamental about fire is just increasing your your uh, savings gap so um you want to increase the amount of money you make and decrease the amount of money you spend. So you're, you're increasing your, your savings rate. So that I call that a gap, right? As your gap widens, that means you can save more money, you can invest more money, and that money could grow faster, right? So obviously, if you have a higher income, it's easier to, to save more if, you, if you're spending, say you're making $200,000 and you only spend $50,000, um, you have 150,000 to save. Whereas if you only, if you're only making hundred K and you're spending 50 K, you only have 50 K to save. Right. So obviously that just simple math, it takes longer, but I think it's totally doable. Even you have, um, um, a lower income, uh, it just takes longer. You might need to, you know, look at other work like side hustles or side businesses, you know, try to get promotions, try to increase your income to really accelerate your, your fire journey. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, that's, it's really just good advice anyways. Like even if someone's looking to retire at 55 or 60, it, it still comes down to, if you want to save, you, you certainly need to spend less than you make. And it, yep. that sounds simple, but obviously people can still get that wrong. So it's, yeah. It's, and the, the other thing is people, it's easy for people to, when they start the when they start they the first thing is usually you look at your expenses right but the thing is you can only cut your expenses by so much after a while you start you start um depriving yourself right like you don't want to be eating ramen noodles every day and you know eating unhealthy and and cause your your health to go go sideways right so that that's not good so there's only certain things so much things you could do to um to cut your expenses. So once your expenses are pretty lean, you need to look at, at the other side of the equation by increasing your, your income. So it, it goes hand in hand. And, and the other thing is, I think a lot of people, when they look at fire, they think about extreme frugality, which is, I don't, I don't, dis, I don't agree with that. For me, my, my model on my, on my blog is, you need to find the right personal balance between saving for to for the future and spending for today right you need to still enjoy your life because when you're dead you can't spend the money right <laughs> so that's the reality so i mean you you could always say oh i'll do it later 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 but would later actually come for you right like you know give you an example we uh, my wife and i went to italy for honeymoon like six years ago and we wanted to take a cooking class and it was expensive and i was like we were like looking at the price Okay, we'll do it later. Six years later, we never went back to Italy, right? And now we're kind of like, oh, we should have done that. It wasn't that much money in the hindsight, right? So, so it's, it's about finding that balance between spending and saving for the future. So what's, what's the right balance for me? It might not be the right balance for you, but find that right balance for you so you can still be happy while saving for the future. I think that's very important. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still struggling with that balance too. Uh, when I first got into personal finance and, and started the blog and everything, I was very frugality based. It was cut the expenses that, that seemed to be where to get the money, but you're right. You, you hit a point where 
where you're not going to improve anymore. <laughs> There's only so much you can cut. Um, so that, especially the last few years, I've been more interested in, in sort of the, the make money side of it because there's, there's just so much more, more potential there. Um, you also touched on sort of doing the things that you still enjoy. Um, what, my wife and I did an all inclusive vacation for our honeymoon. That was 10 years ago. Uh, we loved it, but we're only doing our next all inclusive vacation <laughs> this coming year, uh, 10 years later because of, because of work and kids. So, so now we're at a point where it's like, well, we should probably actually be doing this stuff and, and exactly. not waiting to retire just to, just to enjoy a, a trip that is connected to work in any way. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, what well, another question I had too was, uh, I've heard the terms lean fire and fat fire. <laughs> And, and and again, I don't know if this is just the separate camps within this fire community or what, but can you kind of explain what those sure. are? Sure. There's actually like lean fire, fat fire. I think I heard the term brista fire as well. So that's <laughs> yes, crazy. So so lean fire is basically you're just like usually when you said you're financially independent and you can retire early, you, you, you save 25 times of your annual expenses. So it's, it's the four percent withdrawal rule. Um, so that that's typical called lean fire. Um, it's where you're you're just sustain your current lifestyle. Fat fire is is you're you're actually greater than twenty five percent twenty five times. So you're you're essentially living a little bit at large in retirement. So you're you're spending a lot a lot more than than your your lean fire. Okay. And then uh, Bruce Tuck fire is this, I think this applies more to the States is because health insurance is, it's a mess in the States, right? So a lot of people actually then go work at Starbucks so they could get health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they don't have to worry that aspect of it. But here in Canada, that's, that's, that's something we don't have to worry about, which makes fire a lot easier in Canada, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's something else I wanted to touch on was, was sort of what makes, what makes fire different in Canada? You, you mentioned healthcare. Is, is there any other things that are different? Um, I, I heard something in the States. Um, I was probably on some American blog where uh, if, if you make a certain amount, you can, you can qualify for social security or something like that's almost one of the goals. Um, yeah. <laughs> is, is there certain uh, um, salary I amounts think, we're looking at? I think Canada? for one, the uh, our TFSA doesn't have a, a withdrawal uh, age limit. Like I think the equivalent in the states, I think it's the Roth. Roth um, IRA. Yeah, they, there's like a you have to be age for like 51 before you can withdraw, I believe. Whereas TFSA, you can withdraw any, you make a withdraw any time, right? So that that's a that makes a lot. Uh, it's a lot flexible in Canada. Uh, health insurance for one, for sure. That's a huge. Huge aspect, right? Because you, I mean, I, I hear stories of people going in for simple surgeries and they can come out with like ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar bill, even though they're insured. It's crazy, right? Um, yeah. Other than that, I don't think there's significant difference because we have, I mean, we have CPP and OH Security. I think they have something similar in the states as well. Um, RSP, which they have something similar, um, which is capped, and uh, you can only withdraw at a certain age. Before, uh, if you withdraw before that, you get a penalty. Um, yeah, it's pretty similar. I think the healthcare is is the biggest difference, for sure. Yeah, I, I think with uh, with something like CPP, yeah, the, you have to wait to a certain age, and you should, uh, the, the longer you wait with CPP, the more you get. So if, if you're able to live without that, you're all the better for it. Um, another thought I had while you were saying that was, was obviously the TFSA is way more, um, useful, <laughs> but, uh, the RSP that you can withdraw when you're at a low income. So if, if you're keeping your, say, say you are that guy making 200,000 a year and putting money into an RSP, Mm -hmm. um, you could withdraw that in your forties or whatever, say, uh, yeah. because maybe you've purposely kept your income down to a really low tax bracket. Yeah. I actually did some calculations on my blog where I basically did a, did a tax assumption when we're retired and, uh, and we're living off our dividend income or whatever income from, um, 
from investing and and simulate like how much can we withdraw from RSP without getting hit. So with RSP, if you withdraw, I think 5,000 or more, below 5,000, I get, I think the withholding tax is 10%. And then 5,000 and up to 10,000 is 20% and above that is 30%. So I, I did some simulations and, and found we could withdraw, like my wife and I could withdraw, like I think $10,000 each without, and still get that money back. So that's that's pretty significant if you think about it. That's that's twenty thousand dollars right there that you could you could use each year. Right? Yeah, and even if you even if you went into that next tax bracket, it it would still be less than probably what you contributed it to it in. Like if if you're in a higher tax bracket in the first exactly. month, you get yeah. you get that tax refund. Yeah. So so yeah, maybe maybe fire is easier in in uh, in Canada. Um, one one thing you mentioned too though was. You live in in Vancouver, which is very very far from cheap. Um, <laughs> uh, I I don't know if there's a lot of great opportunities in Canada, but but when I look at the U.S., I see a lot of and and you touched on it too. Was there's a lot of places where you can live a lot cheaper. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, healthcare then becomes a problem, so you might not want to just pack up and move to the states. But uh, um, I don't know. Have you have you considered like if you were to go fully fire, would you move from Vancouver? Yeah, I mean, I mean, as I referred earlier, technically we could be fired um, or FI if we, and, and by that I meant if we pack up in Vancouver, sell our house and, and move somewhere else, right? My, my wife is from Denmark. Now, Denmark isn't the cheapest <laughs> place on earth either, but I'm originally from Taiwan and that's certainly a lot cheaper than, than Vancouver and Denmark, for example. So we thought about maybe we could move to Asia for a couple of years, you know, to leave somewhat cheap or, you know, um, or even in Europe, like Italy, Italy, uh, Portugal, Spain, those are pretty cheap countries. So there, there are different ways and, and it's called geo arbitrage. So essentially you, you try to find a lower cost of living such you don't have to save as much money to, to claim yourself as fired. Um, so that, that's a, that's a, that's one of the things you could certainly do. I mean, there are also people that sell their house and travel around in an RV, right? That's another way to reduce your living expenses. So it, it just what you're comfortable with. And, and I think we're, what we learned is we're, we're trying to be as flexible as we can. We got two young kids. So we thought, Hey, if we, you know, move to Asia for a couple of years, I mean, that, that would be a great learning experience for the kids, right? I mean, we could homeschool them. They could learn different languages, learn different cultures. I think that's, that's way better than, you know, put them in school for two years and, and learn from books. It's, I think you gain way more experience by traveling as a kid or as, a, yeah, as an adult, right? So that's certainly something we're considering, for sure. Well, and then at an early enough age, too, I don't think they're going to... To, to mind at all. Um, exactly. I, I know as my kids start to get older, if, if I tried to move them around, they'd probably be a little upset at me if, <laughs> so, or, or tell them, tell them we had to live in an RV now, but yeah. <laughs> um, so, so is there anything else I'm, I'm missing here about fire? Uh, um, no, I think, I think in general, if we're talking about fire in Canada, I think there's not as many, um, bloggers that blog about fire. No, um, it's it's predominantly American. So a lot of the information you get are sort of American related. I mean, the the concept still apply um, for the most part. But like when you you start talking about healthcare, I kind of tune myself out. Um, yeah, and and especially with uh, you know tax deferred or tax tax advantage accounts that that's a bit different right like the tax situation is certainly different in canada versus the state so um it's nice to have like there i know a few fire bloggers in canada which so it's nice to connect with them and and the feedback i get from my readers most of them are canadian it's like oh it's nice to get a canadian perspective when it comes to you know investing and how to achieve fire and stuff so i think that's that's pretty neat to have that and and i mean it's different each with each country too, right? So there, I think there, the fire movement as it grows, they're certainly getting more popular in Europe 
in Asia. So there's a few bloggers here and there in different countries as well. For uh, for Canadians, um, in addition to your own blog, of course, what other blogs could they be checking out? Um, Millennial Revolution. So they, I think they retired in their early 30s. And uh, they're, I think they're trapped, they're living in Europe for a year right now. So they're, they're but I, I think their sites are more geared toward Americans, to be honest. But I could be wrong. I, I read here and there. Um, uh, my own advisor talks about fire, but um, he, he's, Mark is more, maybe more personal finance oriented. Um, can't think of that many. Um, well, ultimately, any, yeah. any personal finance blog. It's, it's like, about fire, yeah. It's, exactly. Uh, yeah, like I, I can't think of anyone that wants to fix their finances that isn't interested in retiring early to some degree. Yeah, uh, nobody nobody wants to have to work until they're seventy. Exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, um, and, and like like you said, if if one of the biggest points is ultimately just comes down to that cash flow of of spend spend less than you make, and anybody that does that and tries to as as you said increase that gap more and more, um then they're heading in the right direction that that also helps them come retirement because uh, mm-hmm. one thing I think people have issues with sometimes is, is they're, they're used to spending at a certain level while they're working. And, yeah. and even as a traditional retirement, say 60 or something, um, they uh, it's hard to make that adjustment. Now, now you're, you're not going to work you and, and how do you change your spending? But if, if you're, if you're sort of living as lean as you you can comfortably, Mm-hmm. That, that's got to help a long ways and, and any blog could help with that. Yeah. And I think, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong if you retire at whatever age 65 or whatever, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's just, you know, some people live 14 till they're 65 or longer. Right. So just because you're retiring at 65 or 66 or 67 doesn't make you less successful than people that retire at age 30. So, because people look at, like myself, for example, they're like, oh, you're thinking of achieving fire in your 30, 40. So that, that's amazing. You know, you must be so successful. And so I'm like, no, like I'm no, not any more successful than say someone else that retired at 64, 65. It's just, again, going back to, to what we talked about at the beginning, it's we each have different uh, life path and my situation is different than yours. So you can't judge the two people. Like you just can't, right? So Still, if somebody says, oh, they're retiring at age 65, say congratulations, you know, wish, wish them well and stuff like that. It's, you know, just be, be encouraged and supportive. Yeah, and if someone wants to work longer, that, that, that's totally fine. But I, I think the, just having that ability to know you didn't need to would be, would be nice. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it does change that mindset. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, thanks for being on the show. And can you tell everybody where they can find you? Yeah, uh, thanks. First, thanks for having me on the show. Um, you can find me on my blog, talkhan.com. So that's T A W C A N.com. Uh, I'm also pretty active on Twitter. So you can find me at talkhan. So that's T A W C A N again. So you can find me there. And uh, yeah, drop me off a line if you want to chat and learn more about Fire. Great. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, no problem. Thanks to Bob for breaking down fire for us. You can find the show notes for this episode at maplemoney.com slash Bob Lai. That's B-O-B-L-A-I. If you're interested in achieving fire, head over to maplemoney.com slash save dash money, where you'll find all our articles on frugal living, paying off debt, and saving your money. Thanks for listening to the show. See you next week.